Good morning. Welcome to Covenant Community Church here in Vacaville, California. Wherever you're at tuning in with us online, we are so happy that you're here joining us. Also, welcome back, everyone. It's our first week back in-house, praising and communing as one. Please praise with us.
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. Mending every house. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is you're working even when I don't feel it you're working never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working never stop you never stop working never stop you never stop working Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Good morning. During this time of uncertainty, I have to con continually remind myself 
that all this is not a surprise to God. He knew that giving us free choice and living in a fallen world, that bad things could happen. That's why he left us words of guidance and hope in the scriptures. He promised to never leave us or forsake us. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guide your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. With these words in mind, let us pray. Lord God, we love you, and we praise you, and you will never change. When all things around us are uncertain and fearful, you are the only constant in our lives. You love us so much, you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins so that we could obtain eternal life. All you ask is that we believe in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, it seems every day we are waiting for the next shoe to drop and bombarded, bombarded with messages of fear, unrest, hopelessness, and division. But Lord, you ask us to trust you and continue to pray for healing for ourselves, our family, and our country, and this world. Lord, help us to take the time to be still and listen to your guidance as we pray. Help us to be reminded of all the blessings in our lives and remember to thank you, the God of creation, for our very existence. Help us to take the time to read your word in the Bible, to know your character, who you are and whose we are. Help us to remember to thank you and praise you for the loving, holy God you are. Help us to be confident and courageous when we move forward this year, these years to come, to trust that you will never leave us or forsake us. And now as together, let us pray the words that you taught your disciples to pray, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. this prisoner and say to me son stop fighting a fight it's already been won I am redeemed you set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed I am redeemed All of my life I have been called on 
the voice of my shame and regret But when I hear you whisper Child, lift up your head I remember, oh God You're not done with me yet I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain No, I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be the old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone Because I've got a new name, a new life I'm not the same and I hope that will carry me home I am redeemed Set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed For God so loved the world, He gave His Son. To bear the weight of sin, He bled for us. From heaven's highest place, He took a fall And there was just one life Laid down for all Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Against 
against us we will prosper the gates of hell won't stand your church will rise from glory to glory in the name of Jesus your heads and pray with me. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to be together. Hallelujah that it is the first weekend that we have been able to have people in your house in a long, long time. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for this alone. Lord, I pray for Pastor Julia as she comes to deliver your message. I pray that those who already believe are lifted high. And those who do not know you are found. They're found by you because they allowed Christ, your son, into their hearts. So that they are seen. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. In covenant said, amen. Well, good morning. It's nice to see you here all masked up. We're excited to uh, be together, praying that uh, we are able to continue to do this, the good Lord willing. My hope always is that as we come together, that we would come together with a uh, hopeful anticipation of what God will do in the midst of it and that uh, as we're trying to wrestle with God's word, that as much as we can, that we'd have an open heart to say, God, how are you speaking to me at this day, at this particular moment? It's always my, my prayer. Uh, we're in our second week of 1 Thessalonians, and we're looking at this reminder to be encouraged. And my hope is that you are encouraged as you hear God's word. Uh, there's a guy named Francis Asbury. Uh, he was a itinerant preacher, and he rode 6,000 miles a year on horseback for 50 years of his life. You think, good gravy, why would you do that? He did that because he felt compelled, called, encouraged, urged to go and preach the good news out uh, in the kind of country towns where there were not churches. And he, he was so um, intent on being a good use, uh, being a good steward of his time, using his time well, let's say it together, uh, being a good steward of his time and using his time well, that he, uh, he didn't waste any time by stopping and resting. He really just re uh, rode straight through. He, he actually said that he ate venison jerky. I mean, if that doesn't say hallelujah, I don't know what does. But he ate the venison jerky because he could grab it and go. It was uh, his entire life purpose and great joy to serve, to proclaim the good news. At the end of his ministry, he had recruited 700 other traveling preachers, people who would be these circuit riders who would ride horseback and go out into the far reaches, the frontier, that they might preach the good news. He did that, and they did that so their lives would be changed. 
So he had recruited 700, and in 1771, five years later, there were 200,000. From 600 Methodists to 200,000, God used those 700 traveling preachers to preach the good news. The days of circuit riding preaching, and certainly Asbury, may have concluded. Uh, we have different ways of proclaiming the good news. But make no mistake, dear ones. God is calling you to go to whatever your frontier might be, your workplace, your home, the store, the post office, the internet. God is calling you to go out to preach the good news. He, he wants us not only to preach the good news, but to share our lives with people because they are so dear to us. So be encouraged, dear ones. God is in the midst of it, and he's calling you. Ordinary, average, everyday people just like you and me to share the gospel as we love people. Let's pray together, shall we? God, we're grateful for your mercy and the ways that you show yourself to us. We pray that more and more you'd remind us of your goodness, that you would encourage us, that we might be an encouragement to one another, that you would help us to see people as you see them, God, that you would whisper into our ear or call at the top of your lungs that we are called to this ministry, that our lives work is to share our lives in the gospel with people. So it's with confidence and hopefulness we pray all these things in the powerful and mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. Our text today is taken from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, we typically at this church use NIV, but I'm going to be preaching out of NRSV because I'm going old school. That's how I learned this text. This text, you've heard me preach on it. When I first got here, it's it's my, one of my favorite texts in all of scripture. It is, in fact, my life purpose, my life uh, work. So 1 uh, first Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Hear the word of our Lord. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our heart. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with the pretext for greed, nor do we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. My favorite verse of the Bible for me. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you have become so very dear to us. May God bless the reading of his holy word. And all God's people said, Amen. So, so deeply do we care for you, and that really is the precipice of this, or the, the, the first thought of this text, that God's people are called to care for one another. We know that Paul and Silas and Timothy cared for the church. They have returned because they want to be an encouragement. Their care for the people is evident as they've been praying for them, as they've been uh, asking people about them as they've been telling people about the good work that God is doing in and through the people of Thessalonica. In verse 1, he sa it says, you yourselves know, brothers and sisters. See, Paul is defending here his character, uh, trying to answer this question of people saying, well, why, is, why have they come back to, after so long? They must have some sort of ulterior motive. And, and so here Paul is defending his character, which is being attacked in his ministry, not because he's insecure, because if you've read anything about Paul, Paul is clear about why he's there. 
Silas is clear about why he's here. Timothy is clear about why he's here. They're not saying, oh, people have been mean to us and they're saying bad things about us. No, they are coming back to encourage the church because there are enemies in Thessalonica. You'll see it in Acts 17, verse 5 and 6, and, and also continuing in verse 13. He, they don't really care so much that they are discredited, but what they want to make sure is that their honor is, is clear so that it doesn't discredit the gospel. That they're very clear about what people say about them might impact how they view the gospel. And so he takes this moment, they take this moment to clarify exactly why they're there. And they say, you yourselves know, brothers and sisters. Now he's writing to Jews and Gentiles, people who have been pagan worshipers who turned. You remember it said in chapter 1, they turned from their worship of the idols that they might worship and serve a living God. And, and so here is this encouragement, this, you know, brothers and sisters, they have a changed identity, a changed purpose. He's coming to them as family, saying, you know that our coming to you was not in vain. This coming to you is kind of an interesting word. It actually means entrance. This coming to you is an entrance. And so as I was reading about that, I was like, oh, I did. that's kind of a cool image. Uh, that Paul and Silas and Timothy come from a, a ways away, and they come and they make this entrance. But it's not just them making the entrance, isn't it? It's, it's this entrance of the gospel in the midst of them. It's this entrance of Jesus and what Jesus has done and will continue to do in their lives in the midst of them. This door that God has opened has, has, is being walked through with Paul and Silas and Timothy, and that they're inviting uh, the people of the church of Thessalonica to come and enter that door as well. It says, so that our coming to you, this entrance into the door that God has opened, that our coming to you was not in vain. And, you know, I, I read that, and you think about vain, like vanity, vanity is all is vanity, right? And, then, and, and all the, the money we put into products trying to look younger, all the things that we try to do to make our outside look a little bit better, that's not the vanity, the vain that he's talking about. That word is a unique word. It means empty or without context or power. It's the same image that you would use for a cup being emptied and that there's an empty cup, but there's nothing in the midst of it. So he's saying that his ministry wasn't hollow, what they had done in the power of the Holy Spirit on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ in the people of Thessalonica. He was saying that that wasn't empty. So that our coming, the door that's been opened, was not empty or hollow or without purpose or merit. And he starts to list out why that is just so. Uh, there's a guy named Sandhu Sudar Singh who was talking about the incarnation of Christ. And he holds up this uh, red bottle. And he says, what do you think's in here? And, and, and they could see that it was a milk bottle, but... They were trying to figure out what might be in it. It might be water, it might be wine, it might be brandy, it might be... There's all kinds of things, he says, that it could be. And, and they had quite a little uh, description and, and uh, a conversation about all the things that it could be in the midst. And he takes the bottle and he dumps it out and just milk dumps out on the floor. And, and they only see what's in the middle of it when they see what's poured out right in front of them. And isn't that how it is for us? We are ministers of the word and sacrament. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are ministers of reconciliation. We are followers of Christ. We can shine ourselves up and we can put on our best church clothes and memorize all the perfect Bible memory verses. But if they don't see what's inside of us, they won't hear it. So deeply do we care for you. That love that is in us needs to bubble out and pour out. And it, and it does that so that people will see, but it, it shows a little bit more of who we are. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you the gospel of God. 
So if you had all the time in the world, you could go back and do a Google search and say, how is Paul called to ministry? And you know the story, right? Paul is, is uh, walking along the street, and he's blinded, and he meets Jesus. And at that moment, everything that was behind him, this life of persecuting Christians, this life of hunting down followers of Christ, everything that was behind him was in fact behind him because he came face to face with the Lord. And at that point, he knew that his life would never be the same. Everything going forward might be informed on what's behind, and he might be, uh, have some information or some experiences or from relationships, but there is a shift. There is a shift when Paul meets Jesus and says, I want my life to be different. And there's all kinds of verses. I'm the least of these, and yet God has called me to proclaim the good news. He makes this shift from what he was and what he understood to be true and who he thought he was and his identity and his, his lineage and all this, and he went, my life's going to be different. So he says, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you the gospel of God. And then he starts to list a little bit about how God has been working in his life. In verse 2, he says, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition now, remember, he had all kinds of persecution. It's not like he went, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be a, uh, proclaim the good news. And everyone will be like, hey, you're a cool dude. Come on in. Let me, like, take care of you. Hey, you're sorry because you killed all these people and, and, and you were, you know, basically a horrible human being? That's all right. Jesus has found you. Come on in. Oh, wait, you're going to tell me that as a Jew, I'm, not no, I'm no longer the chosen person? Well, because you met Jesus, that's okay. Come on in. We're all friends. That's not, in fact, at all what happened with him. Right? He had oppositions from the Christians because he had such a, you know, salty history. He had oppositions from the Jews because he was betraying his faith, the, the called faith of the Jews. And yet he met Jesus and everything changed. He says, he, in spite of the great opposition, you may remember we talked about it last week, even just right before he came, he was in jail in Philippi. Remember, he was chained and jailed, and he sang songs of, of praise. So in spite of the great opposition, now i got to tell you, sometimes I cry because people are mean to me because I'm a Christian. Sometimes I'm like, boo-hoo, because... People don't really take me seriously or, or the gospel seriously. I mean, maybe you felt that way. And here he is saying, in spite of great opposition, we had courage in our God. Courage is always used in the New Testament. That phrase is always used kind of linked to proclaiming the gospel. And, and the opposition, that same word means agony. In spite of the agony it's the same word that they use for athletic competitions, wrestling or fighting. It's strenuous. It hurts. And so here he is saying that the Christian life and proclaiming the good news is sometimes challenging. It requires dedication and great effort. But he says, even in the midst of that, we had courage in our God. It says that we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated in Philippi, right? It's not just Thessalonians. So the Thessalonians are giving them a hard time. It's the, the Philippians are giving them a hard time, and so on and so on. He says no matter any of that, we have great courage in God. He was jailed in Philippi and flogged, physically flogged. You see that in Acts 16. But his testimony and preaching is no matter what happens, I'm determined. No matter what happens, I have great courage in God. And he's mistreated. This is this outrageous treatment. It's a public insult. Remember, in a shame culture, it's a big deal. And, and, and this mistreatment, this public insult is done to break his spirit. And yet it's a testimony of God's faithfulness. And the testimony of Paul, who would say he's the least of these. God is still working. And then he continues in verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. The appeal is the general terms this gospel. And the deceit, that deceit actually means a bait trap. You know what a bait trap is? 
where you lure someone in or lure something in and you kind of just scoop it up. It's a bait trap. See, here he is in the midst of uh, people who he loves. He planted the church. He was there for three weeks and then he had to leave because of the opposition. And so when he comes back, people are like, what's going on with Paul? He ran away after three weeks. Why is he back? He must be coming back because he's trying to work an angle. He must be coming back because he's trying to take advantage of us. He must be coming back because, because, because. And so here is this image of, he reminds, for our appeal does not spring from this wandering or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with this message of the gospel. So in the midst, in the midst of this challenge, in the midst of this commentary, in the midst of everything that's been going around, in the midst of that, he says, I am entrusted by God. His message is pure. He has been suffering faithfully, and yet he's in the midst of it. Hey, Barb Cantrell, would you give me a glass of water? <coughs> this message of the gospel in the midst of the city is lined, this city is lined with pagan gods, multicultural. At every point that there could be opposition, there is, in fact, opposition. And here is the message of the gospel. No matter what happens, no matter who people say you should be serving, no matter what your history has been, no matter, no matter, no matter, God calls us to love and serve a living God. And here is the gospel that he has been entrusted with. And in verse 4 it continues, Even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our heart. So we speak. It's not just the Bible memory that Paul gives. I mean, Paul knows his Jewish, the Torah, right? He knows the Jewish Bible. And he knows this, this, this good word that God has given him. He knows this Jesus. And what he says here more and more is that he's not just speaking with words. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> He says, I'm not speaking just to please people, but to please God. Now the speaking is the speaking, and then the speaking, and then the speaking, and then the speaking. It is continuous uh, proclamation. And so here is this intent, this decisiveness, the determination that he has. He says, I'm not going to keep chasing after people to feel good or to have them feel good. I'm not going to try to say the right thing so that people would think well of me. He says, no. I'm going to please God and please God and please God and please God as much as I can. Because the reality is we know you can't please men as your first priority. You can't please mortals as your first priority. You have to please God. And then God will, will do what he's going to do. And we do this, and he does this, who tests our heart. Test is the same word as the approved. So he has been approved, he's been called, he's been verified by God. And it's actually the same word, who tests our heart. It's one who continually tests our heart over and over, that God is the heart tester, and that we are approved by God, and God tests as we continue to step out. In verse 5 and 6, the text continues. As you know, as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with pretext for greed, nor do we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others. So here is this reminder. He says, we never. Not in the beginning when they started out, three weeks before that, or when they first started the church. It's not when they're facing persecution. It's not when things are tough. It's not when things are good. He understands that his behavior and the behavior of those who follow Christ make a difference in how people receive the gospel. So, so we have never come to you with flattery. And flattery is not just like, man, I like that dress. That looks cute. Or I like that tie. You look sharp. It's not the flattery that we think. This idea of deception. But it's an idea of deception. Someone to make something, it's more than just to make someone feel good, but to try to get what you want. And, and then he uses this, nor do we seek, pre he comes with this pretext for, for greed. That pretext is actually a cloak. 
So can you imagine this image of being cloaked so that you can get what you want? Now, any day of the week, we look at it and we go, well, of course. If you're not actually an honest person, you shouldn't be preaching the good news. If you're trying to hustle someone and trying to get what you want, people are going to maybe hear the gospel differently. It's that whole, don't do as I say and not as I do. He's clarifying, saying more and more, this is who we are and this is who we came for, how we came. And this pure motivation in the light of the people where they're at is what is so important. And he says, no, we didn't come in the greed. The greed always talks about this in the New Testament, about this disregard. It's not like, oh, I wish I had a little bit more money in my bank account, or oh, I wish I had that new car, or oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. Greed, when they talk in the New Testament, is not talking about that. The greed that they're talking about is t getting what you need above the rights and needs of others. And so what a reminder that is for us. He's saying at the end of the day, I did not come with any of this, and neither did Paul, and or neither did Silas, and neither did Timothy. We never did that because we wanted to make sure that we were not disregarding the gospel. He says, we didn't have the praise from the mortals. Now remember, uh, or the glory, the acceptance of men, not our own personal honor, but the honor of God. Now, glory says, I didn't do this for the glory of men. Remember, glory, when we're talking about the glory of God, is the weightiness. It's not like just this shiny, flip-floppy kind of thing up in the sky where you go, oh, that's glory. No, the glory is the weightiness of God. That we believe that the gospel makes a difference. That we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That we believe that we can build our lives and hope on this truth that God is who he says he is and he's done what he's done. That is spectacular reminder of this steadiness. And it's not the glory of men, it's the glory of God. And so here he says more and more, you cannot have that sort of weightiness, that sort of foundation, that sort of truth uh, from men, it can only be from God. And there is this reminder, right, that God, the weightiness of God is that God loved us so much that he came to this earth, that he did not consider equality with man something to be grasped, but he humbled himself and he came here to this place. And what an encouragement that is for us, that this God, this Jesus came with his hands out and his hands out. He came for you and for me. And we, as people who are proclaiming the good news, who are determined to share the gospel, we come with our hands into the lives of people. We come proclaiming this good news, knowing that people can have their lives changed. And so what a reminder that is for us. Because so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but ourselves in verse 7, it says, we might have made demands as the apostle of, of Christ. The apostles, right, they're called by God, they're called by Jesus to proclaim the good news. They're not only the disciples who follow Jesus, but they're all the people who became followers of Christ. They are the apostles, so they had certain expectations and certain responsibilities. In the same way that I sometimes tell you, encourage you, exhort you, this is what God is calling you. Don't settle for less. I take that privilege because God has called me. God has called me and given me this demand in my life to proclaim the good news. And God has called you as well to make these demands of Christ. In verse 7 and 7b, it says, We were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. That uh, gentleness specifically talks about the kindness of parents towards children. It's this contrast, right? Where he says, I made a demand because I was an apostle, but I was humble before you like a mother caring for his ch her children. And there is this tension, right, that, that God's people live in, this tension that we live in as well, that we demand some things and we come before humbly asking for others. This nursing mother who tenderly cares for her children, it's the same image of the birds covering their young with their feathers. We see that in Deuteronomy 22. 
and Christ caring for the church in Ephesians 5. Her own children, there is this personal connection. She feeds and she protects and she loves her children. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy love their church in that same way. And we as followers of Christ, we as disciples of of the Lord, we are called in the same way to feed and love and care for our people. That's God's call in our life. We see that in, in big ways and in small ways. There's, there's a story about a gentleman named Father Damien. He was a priest who was famous for his willingness to serve lepers. He mo- moved to Kalawao. It's a village on the island of Molokai in Hawaii. It had been quarantined to serve a leper colony. And for 16 years, this man of God served in their midst. He learned to speak their language. He bandaged their wounds. He embraced the bodies that no one else would touch. He preached to hearts that would otherwise have been left alone. He built 2,000 coffins by hand so that when these dear ones died, they would be buried with dignity. Slowly, it was said that Kalawao became a place to live rather than a place to die. Because Father Damien loved them and he shared the gospel. He was not particularly careful about keeping this distance, although many people would. He did nothing to separate himself from these people. He dipped his finger into the bowl of poi. Along with his patience, he shared his pipe. He didn't always wash his hands. He got close. And because of that, the people loved him. He loved them. He so deeply cared for them. And they felt the same. He wasn't just helping them. He became one of them. One day he got up to preach his sermon as was his practice. And instead of saying, dear ones, he said, we lepers. He wasn't just preaching. He was sharing the gospel as he shared his life. He chosen to live as they lived and died as they died because he was so determined to share with them the gospel in his life. So verse 8, my life verse. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel but our very selves because you have become so dear to us. That's why I call you dear ones, because I'm determined to share with you not only the gospel, but my life, because you are dear to me. It's the basis of everything. It's a rare word, determined. It's not just happened upon or excited about. It is a decision. It's not an impulse, but a decision, determination built out of this relationship and transformation of the Lord. And to share the gospel and to share our lives, that word means uh, to give to someone freely, but to keep a bit of it from yourself, for yourself. And that you both have it. It's not just something you have, it's not just something that they have, it's something that you have together. You see, too often Christians are, are committed, myself too, I see this sometimes in myself, even though it's my life verse, Sometimes I want to throw God's word towards them or say, I'll pray for you. I I want to care for them from afar. And I'm not talking about social distance and pandemic. I'm talking about a posture of my heart. And God calls us to more than that. God calls us to share the gospel, to share ourselves, because people are dear to us. The reality is, is that people want to know that you love them, even if they don't believe in Jesus. People want to know that they are dear to you, even when they're so frustrating. Because the reality is, is that's how God shows us. If God was just far away, God saying, now people, come and be in relationship with me. 
Now people, why are you doing that? Now people, not people, but he doesn't. He comes right to us and he walks among, among us and he transforms our lives. There was some time ago a book called 40 Days of Love and it, it was this encouragement to, to, to be determined to share with people the love of Christ. And they, they, they did that specifically through letter writing. A, a pastor who was exuberant to try to get his people to see that these encouragements could be ways that they would not only share the gospel but share the lives. He stood up in the front of his, of his congregation. He proclaimed this opportunity. He, he showed them how God's word could make a difference in, their li- in people's lives, how the, the love of Christ could make a difference in people's lives. Uh, he was eloquent, and people were excited. But there was one guy who came up, and he said, well, that's, Pastor, I love you. I love our church. I'm going to hang in there, but this is not for me. I'm not going to write a bunch of kumbaya letters and, and, and send those out to people. People, you know, we're all responsible for ourselves. And the pastor, even though he's young, said, okay, I'm going to pray that God will change your heart, but it's between you and the Lord. And he was excited that so many of his people were encouraged. They were nodding their heads. They were saying, yes, this would be great to spend these 40 days of intentionality, 40 days of determination to share the gospel in ourselves. And the week went on and the pastor didn't think much of it until this man came up and he had something in his hand and The pastor thought, oh goodness, this guy's going to come and give me an earful again. And and the man had tears in his eyes and he said, pastor, I want to apologize to you. You were right. That's like the best words that pastors can hear. You were right. No, that's not. But he said, why was I right? And he pulled out this letter in his hand and he, he showed him the letter and he said, I thought this was a stupid thing to do. I thought it was a waste of time. And then I got a letter in the mail And I couldn't understand why this guy in my church, who we're friends, but not really friends, how he wrote this letter. But I opened the letter because, you know, it was written to me. And in the letter, it poured out the gospel. It poured out how much he loved me. It poured out how determined he was to share the gospel in himself. And I realized that it actually did make a difference. He said, Pastor, I pulled out my uh, paper and I wrote 10 letters myself. Because I want other people to know that they are loved, even when they don't think it's important. I want people to know that the gospel is for them, even if they think they don't need it. Pastor, I want people to know that I love them. I want to share the gospel with them, and I want to share my life. And that's the reality, dear ones. At the end of the day, I want... I want us to be people who love each other and not just in a kind of a tangential sort of way. And I want our love to be rooted in how much Jesus loves us, that it makes a difference for us. That like Paul, it makes not one bit of difference what's happened in the past. It makes not one bit of difference who we were before. But when we meet Jesus and he tells us to share the gospel and share our lives, it changes everything. If you've been in a meeting with me and uh, you've been at, if we've taken prayer concerns, my prayer most times is that God would give me courage and wisdom as I lead and love my people. That I would know that what God is calling me to do and that I would have the courage to step out and do it. I'm going to encourage you, dear ones, this week, to prayerfully consider who God might be calling you to share your life with as you share the gospel. And then if you write a letter or you send a text or you call them up and say, can we have a social distance coffee? That you would take one step towards doing what God's called you to do in a different way this week. I promise you, your life will never be the same. Let's pray together, shall we? God, we're grateful for your mercy and the ways that you show yourself to us. We pray that more and more you would remind us of your goodness and for the opportunity we have to give you thanks, we do. God, make us be determined 
make us decide right now that we're going to lead people in the way of the gospel and that we're going to love them to the very best of our ability. And we pray with confidence in the powerful and mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Dear ones, God is a good and generous God. He's called us to do just that, to share our lives and to share the gospel. And we come together uh, in the ways that we can do that. Some of us do it in our time. Some of us do it in our talent. Some of us do it in our treasure. God calls us to do it in all three ways. And so as we have an opportunity to participate in this ministry in the church, uh, we have an opportunity to give back. And so as you're prayerfully considering how God might be calling you to use your time Think about how God has given you so much time. As, as God, and as you're prayerfully considering how God might be calling you to use your talents to take care of or to serve a person, uh, do that for the glory and honor of God. And as God has called you to this particular church in this particular moment, we give of our resources because God is good. And so on the screen, there are all kinds of ways that you can do that. You can text us or uh, write a check or give online. We sure would be grateful for your partnering in the ministry. But won't you pray with me? God, we pray that you would take these gifts, that they would be for your good purpose, and that more and more you would remind us of your goodness. Help us this day to be determined to share with others the gospel in our lives because they are dear to us. And we pray in the powerful and mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
that you could worship with us today so happy to see your faces here in church and hope that uh, you'll continue to join us if you feel comfortable to come at 9 30 on sundays if you prefer to worship with us online uh, we'll continue to do that we also have our midweek moment as we're making a margin and that's wednesdays at 7 p.m so here are the blessing dear ones May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and grant you his peace. Go this day, dear ones, knowing that you are loved. Go this day, dear ones, determined to share with others the gospel and yourselves. And go this day, dear ones, in the hope and the peace and the love and the mercy of our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week. God bless you. Thank you.
in weakness your strength and powers to allow your glory to rise you work for all mankind hear me now hear me now this promise I have made This promise I will see to You need me to deliver That's what I will do Cause this promise I have made This promise I will see to You need me to deliver That's what I will do I need a sound mind My spirit is willing My body is weak Hear me now Hear me now